This is Real Estate Rookie episode 315. I will give my parents all the credit in the world because I had no idea that we were poor. But I do remember there was this one day I came home and my mom was bawling at the kitchen table. I remember being like, what's wrong, mom? And she was like, you texted somebody so many times our bill is $600 and we can't afford this. That was a hard moment for me because that was the first time it clicked with me that $600 is everything for certain families. That was sort of that moment where I was like, I will never let my family feel like this again. I'll make sure that my family never feels this way. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I am here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And guest, Rob Abasolo. Hello. <laughs> what, are you do- Sorry. what are you doing? I'm barging here, in man. on your What's intro. What's going on? <laughs> 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 well, anyway, welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And you guys, you know, if you didn't recognize that voice, we do have someone uh, barging in on the intro today. Uh, but before we get to that guy, uh, Ashley, what's going on in your neck of the woods? We haven't done any like boring banter in a while. I know we really haven't. Um, I've been doing a lot of wake surfing. I've got two properties under contract. One is going to be a house flip and the other one is going to be a burr. What about you? Uh, we still have this like ever ongoing uh, uh, campground that we're doing in West Virginia, but it feels like we're finally getting close to the finish line on that Good. one. So fingers crossed we can uh, start breaking ground by the by, before the, the year is over. Um, and honestly, that's pretty much it. Tony, once you close on that, though, I really want to do a rookie reply on that whole process of how that oh, started. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah really we good. learned a lot. Interesting one. Things went well. Things went kind of haywire, but it seems like we're back on track. But honestly, most of my focus right now is building out Robinson Capital. Um, that campground will be the first acquisition under under that new company and really just trying to focus on more kind of commercial acquisitions. Well, today we have a special guest with us. We have the co-host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. And you hello, may know hello. him. As, <laughs> do you want to intro yourself? No, no, you do it. I like what other people talk about. <laughs> you may know him as Rob Bilt. You may have heard him on the podcast, or you may have watched him on YouTube or seen him on social media. So, Rob Abasolo, welcome to the podcast. I would like to know what is one great takeaway that you gave to us on the episode today? I would say the greatest takeaway that someone will get from today's episode is understanding why it's so important to have other people pay for your mortgage. It's a good one. I would add to that, Rob. I love that. But I, I also think the, uh, the idea and concept of starting small, testing and iterating to bigger things is a really important theme from your episode today as well. Yeah. Yeah. You got to scale accordingly. So what we do in this episode is we are going to go through Rob's childhood journey, starting from his early years and things he's learned from his childhood as to kind of shaped him who he is today. He talks about living under your means, frugality, and kind of what his family went through growing up. And you will get the chance to learn a lot more about Rob and how he built his legacy, starting with uh, house hacking. We get real deep in today's episode. We get Rob on the, on the therapy couch, but overall, lots <laughs> of really good things come out of today's episode. Uh, before we keep moving, I just want to give a shout out to someone by the username of MMK2255. They love to say five-star review on Apple Podcasts. This person says, so many thanks to Ashley and Tony. I love the entertainment, knowledge, and motivation from the host and their guest. I started listening four months ago and just closed on my first property. I met Ashley at a conference recently, and she's even more genuine in person. My next goal is to meet Tony. Keep up the boring banter and thanks for everything. Uh, so MK, we appreciate you. Uh, for all of our rookies that are listening, if you haven't yet, please do take a few minutes to leave us an honest rating and review. The more views we get, the more folks we can reach. And the more folks we can reach, the more folks we can help, which is what we love doing here at the Rookie Podcast. If you haven't already, make sure you check us out on YouTube at Real Estate Rookie or join the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group. Rob, welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Show. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are very honored to have you on, and some may be questioning why we have you on today, and we are going to go back to the rookie years, and we'd really like to start with childhood. So, Rob, please indulge. Yes, yes. It's been a long time since I've been a rookie. (laughs) Uh, well, hey, first of all, let me just say thanks for having me on the pod. Uh, so excited to be here. I put in my request in the form many years ago. And so very happy to finally have my moment. 
That is if the episode airs, but yeah, yeah stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You guys will let me know at the end, right? Yeah. So Rob, first, before you go into your childhood, I guess, you know, who are you? Okay. So my name is Rob Abasolo. I am the co-host of the Bigger Pockets podcast and uh, the real estate show specifically. Uh, I'm a YouTuber, content creator. I'm a real estate investor spe- specializing in the world of Airbnb. And uh, I've been doing this for about seven years now and have gone from zero to a, a relatively like por- relatively decent portfolio that I'm really proud of that took a long time to get here. But uh, couldn't have done it had I not had a few really, really hard, difficult, formative years getting into the real estate space. Is that a good introduction? Did I do it right? Yes, very good. You're <laughs> yeah, on the right yeah. path here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go back to your childhood. What was it like for you growing up and how do you feel that that molded you into the, the investor you are today? Totally. So, you know, I grew up really just watching my parents do the the ultimate sacrifice, like living out the ultimate sacrifice for their kids. And what I mean by this is my dad and my mom, they're immigrants from Mexico. Uh, my dad was a doctor in Mexico and my mom worked with him. I, I believe she was a nurse and that's how they, they met. It's quite the romantic story. And they had a great, great life in Mexico and I think a really great trajectory for where they could go. Um, but they wanted to try this whole crazy thing of moving to America and providing a better life for their kids. And that's exactly what they did in my perspective. I, I really had no idea um, how difficult it was financially for my parents growing up because as a kid, you don't really see that kind of thing. But what I did see was that my parents were always working. Uh, they were always working second jobs. And um, you know, a lot of people would, would ask here, like, why didn't your dad just you know, move, move his license over to, to America. And he was unable to, he didn't speak any English and he tried to move his doctor's license over to America and he took the test twice and he failed. And it's because he really just was unable to do it because not only was he struggling to learn English and, you know, do all that kind of thing, but he's also having to work a minimum wage job to really provide for for the family and everything like that. So I think after a couple of times of giving that a shot, he just decided to sort of make the decision like, hey, I I can't keep pursuing this dream of becoming a a doctor in America. I've I've now got to bootstrap this thing, work jobs, provide for my family and everything like that. And so... um, That was really tough for me because I remember thinking as a kid that my dad is like the smartest man I've ever known. And he would talk to me about health and things and doctor stuff because, you know, I guess he didn't really get to talk about it all that much at work. But, you know, he worked minimum wage, a minimum wage job for so long. And I think it all sort of like clicked for me because I remember one day they were bringing me uh, to an, to an office building at night and I didn't really know what was happening. It was like third or fourth grade. And my parents were working full-time jobs during the day. And as soon as they finished those shifts, they would basically come pick me up from school. I think we would eat. And then they would go work another job as janitorial staff at these commercial buildings. And that was really confusing for me because I didn't really, you know, I didn't really grasp it. And through this journey, I just saw them always doing different things to make more money until eventually they went and they bought a house and they started fixing it up and they would take me to the house every single day. And I remember they sold it and they flipped it. And it was such a big deal for them because I think they made like 20 or $25,000. And it was like, you know, a huge, huge monumental moment for my family. They went and they did another flip and they made 20,000 or 25,000. And again, life-changing income for them. And then eventually they go and they go to a tax auction and they buy this amazing house in the Heights of Houston, which is actually, uh, you know, it's a really, really good part of town. And they thought they got a once in a lifetime deal, but I think they didn't really know the English perfectly, the legal terms or anything like that. And I saw them basically buy the liens on the house. <laughs> they didn't even buy the house. They bought like the debt associated with it or something. And they put every single cent, everything they had ever owned, any savings into this house until eventually the owner came back and took it from them. And that was like a a catastrophe financially. And uh, they never 
moved on with real estate after that. That's where they were like, we can never do this again. And I saw this firsthand. And I remember thinking at that moment for me, like, okay, my parents came here. They lived the ultimate sacrifice for me. I didn't really understand real estate, but I was like interested. They were always telling me, hey, real estate, this is how people become wealthy. And they tried it and they failed. And I, I sort of felt it was my duty and my responsibility to, to carry on the torch and sort of finish what they started. Rob, first, you know, thank you for, for being so transparent with your story. Um, you know, I think a lot of people come from similar backgrounds where they aren't hand, handed success on, on a silver platter and they, they kind of have to grind it out. But something I'm curious about because I, I see kind of parallels in my own life where, you know, my, my parents divorced when I was very young. I spent most of my formative years living with my mom. She worked two jobs at a lot of points just to kind of keep the lights on. And I, I, I developed almost this scarcity mindset around money because things were always kind of tight growing up and and I still kind of see how that how that impacts me as an adult in different ways you know so mm-hmm. I'm, I mean like how has that impacted you you know like like your parents coming Big across time. the border and and yeah I mean just talk to you that time. have you seen that play out as an as an adult so like I said when I was a kid like I will give my parents all the credit in the world cuz I had no idea that we were poor like I wouldn't even it's hard to even say that because of the life that they gave me and like how much they gave to to always make it feel okay for me as a kid and safe as a kid. But I do remember there was this one day um, I came home after school. It was in seventh grade. And it's when I actually was when I had first met my my now wife, but then uh, my crush. And uh, I was texting with Ash, my wife, thousands of times. This was back in the day when unlimited data plans didn't exist. And I came home and my mom was bawling at the kitchen table. And uh, I remember being like, "What's what's wrong, mom? And she was like, you texted somebody so many times our bill is $600 and we can't afford this. And that was a hard moment for me because that I think was the first time it clicked with me that it's like $600 is everything right for certain families. And so that was sort of that moment where I was like, I will never let my family feel like this again. And I will never, I'll make sure that my family never feels this way. Um, and so it really was those things where growing up after that, like I was the cheap guy. I was the guy that my friends made fun of. I was the guy that was always starting side hustles. I remember I fell for this infomercial one time that was called like the greatest inf- the greatest vitamin in the world. And you would basically sell these vitamins for, <laughs> it was like a multi multivitamin for like 20 bucks. And if you sold it to 20 people, they would give you a thousand dollars. And I remember like always trying these weird different things to just make money. I would be uh, at work in my, at my very first job. And I would wait for my, my, like the meetings at noon that were like catering lunch. I would like watch them from my desk or I would like ask my coworkers that were next to that meeting to alert me the moment that that meeting was over so that I could run to the kitchen and get free lunch. And uh, my friends always made fun of me for it. But for me, I just always felt like I had to like always save every single dollar that I ever had. I had to be super cheap so that, yeah, basically I could stash my money and, and hopefully put it towards something that would build something for me later on. I never really realized that eventually that would culminate into real estate. So those kind that your friends made fun of you for, is this you're talking high school into adulthood? <laughs> yeah, it was well into adulthood. That's okay. It started in high school. They would always be like, Rob, you're the deal guy. But then in my early part of my, my advertising career, that was it. And even until like the end of my advertising career, honestly, until like three or four years ago, I was like this. And uh, my very first advertising career, I was making $40,000 a year, which at that time was like everything. I was like, oh my gosh, it's the most money I'd ever made in my life. And so I thought that getting this job, I was going to be financially free and independent. My wife was nannying. She was making $12 an hour. And it turned out that after all of the expenses, we just didn't have that much left over. And so I had always remembered my dad saying, hey, real estate is the way, real estate is the way. And so we got a tax return eventually that was like 5,000 bucks or something. And I was like, let's use this as a down payment for our home. And uh, basically that was that, that tax return is what funded the very first house that I ever had. And we were super house poor. And uh, that really accelerated how cheap I was at work and all that kind of stuff because we were putting all the money we ever had into our first house. Can you give us a little more insight as to how valuable you think that was that you lived below your means? 
as to you didn't go and, you know, spend lavishly, even though you got this new career is, you know, a $40,000 job, which at the time was a lot of money. So how can you, what advice can you give to our listeners as to how they can live below their means? They can follow those same kind of principles of that frugality. And oftentimes I think frugality is kind of like looked upon like, Ugh, I don't want to be frugal, but more of it is just like living below your means and maintaining that balance of how not to have that lifestyle creep. Yeah, totally. Well, you know, my dad always said, sacrifice everything for a couple of years and then everything that drips from the tree is honey. Um, I, that's a loose translation of what it was. He always said it in Spanish, but basically that always stuck with me that it was totally okay to live uh, to live cheaply, right? Because in college, as a kid, I didn't have a lot. And so it wasn't really the biggest adjustment for me to get a full-time job because I was always super scared of not having anything. And so for me, I always felt it was worth it to sacrifice comfort, sacrifice friends, my, my sacrifice social life more than, more than anything. And my wife was on board too. And uh, I wish I could say that there was like a big strategy here. I just knew that we didn't have money to spend. And so there was no reason to spend it. Um, I, there were so many moments at the beginning of, of my career and real estate life where my wife would go spend five bucks at Target and literally instantly, like five minutes, because I was checking my bank statement every single day. I would text her and I'd say, what did you buy at Target? All the time. And uh, that's embarrassing for me, but it's we just didn't have it. So we were always trying to stash away every dollar because I was just looking for the opportunity that it could strike. One thing I want to add here, Rob, is that a, you know you, you talked about taking that first tax return and using that as your your seed money. Um, and we've heard that story from from countless other people. Um, Ashley Hamilton, she was uh, she's the the Detroit yeah. investor. She's she's had awesome. Some super mm-hmm. yeah super popular podcasts on the on the real estate show. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys should go back and listen to hers. But that's that's how she started with with what the, with, with her tax return. Um, I, I guess let me let me ask this one question. For a lot of people, it's easy to you know get. For some people, that's the biggest check they get every year is their tax mm-hmm. return. Um, uh, how tempting was it for you, I guess, to go put that into something else versus investing into real estate? And how did you have the discipline to to use it towards something that was really going to benefit you long term? So this was something that really clicked for me in college because I remember my my best friend, my roommates, we were paying so much money in rent. I mean, I think our place was like two or three thousand bucks. And I remember one time senior year, I was like, man, I wonder how much I've paid in rent. And I calculated that over the years, me and my roommate had basically paid like fifty or sixty thousand dollars of of rent to like landlords basically, right? And I remember thinking, granted I didn't know how amortization worked at that time, but I was like, man, sixty thousand dollars, that's like I could have bought a uh, you know, a hundred and fifty thousand dollar house and only owe ninety thousand dollars, you know? Uh, obviously with interest it's not exactly how it was, but that did click for me. Like that was something that was so clear that I was sort of paying so much money, but never actually getting a benefit other than obviously a place to live. And so I remember moving to Kansas City for my first job, the one I was telling you about in advertising, and I was renting a place for 800 bucks a month. And it was like a small, like four or 500 square foot place. It was a two one. So those rooms were tiny. And it was me and my wife and our two dogs. And we were crammed in there. And I remember being so fed up with being crammed in this tiny place and I was paying 800 bucks and I mathed it out. And I was like, man, we are effectively paying like, you know, $9,600 a year. And I've been paying rent for the past three years. And the whole calculation came up again. And one of my coworkers was like, yeah, you know, one of my, me and my best friend bought our house in college and like we owned half of it outright. And he sort of like clicked this whole thing with me that, oh my gosh, like I wasn't crazy for thinking that someone actually had done it. And so understanding the idea early on of building equity in something and not just dumping money into rent was actually a relatively straightforward decision. And so I pitched my wife. I said, hey, we just got this tax return. We're paying 800 bucks a month. You know, it'd be really cool is if we were paying $800 a month towards a mortgage, but we own it. And, you know, once it's paid off, it'll be worth like a lot of money. And she was like, are you sure? Is this something like we can afford? I was like, definitely not, but we should talk to a banker. (laughs) And the banker was like, okay, you can barely afford this. Are you sure you want to do it? Like, wink, wink, you don't want to do it. And I'm like, sign me up. And so really early on, I think the the principle, I didn't know what equity was. I didn't understand the mechanics of it. I just knew that this idea of owning a house would provide freedom for me because I knew conceptually that once that house is paid off, 
I had something that I could then sell and get all the money back out. I didn't know about refi. I didn't know about cash outs or anything like that. So for me, I was like, well, what am I going to do with the $5,000? Like, I, I guess I'll go go out to eat or something like that. But for me, I was like, no, nah, like we should, we should buy a house. So Rob, talk us through that, that first deal, man. Once you convinced your wife to, to kind of take this leap of faith, what are the next steps you took? What did that first deal actually look like? Yeah, sure. So, so this house was $159,000, which was really like a lot for us. And, and what market was that? This was Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City. Okay. Yeah. Actually, yeah. like fun fact, I actually just found out like last year that there's a Kansas City and Kansas and a Missouri. So, mm. you know, I'm always yeah. learning something new. I'm geographically challenged. So Missouri is the cool side. Okay. <laughs> so there's, there's a difference. There's a difference. When you go out there, people are always like, are you on the Kansas side or the Missouri side? There's, they're both great. I'm just, I'm just messing yeah. with all the people. So, uh, but Missouri for sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, anyway, so, um, I buy this house $159,000. And our budget was like 125 and we struck out. We kept striking out every, you know, it's kind of funny. Like real estate is this really weird boomerang where like you strike out, you get demotivated and then you kind of stop. Like we had put on offers, nothing really fit our buy box. Um, and so we were just like, you know what, let's just take two weeks and let's just take a break. Like maybe the house hunting isn't for us. And I remember getting on Craigslist of all places and I found a house that was $159,000 and I looked at it and it was in a great neighborhood and the, it was all remodeled. And I woke my wife up and I was like, babe, check this out. I think this is the one. And it was a guy that was a flipper that flipped it and he didn't want to use a realtor. So he listed it on Craigslist. And uh, it's kind of funny because I had given up. I took a week or a two week break and I decided to just look because I was like, yeah, why not feel the pain all over again? And I find, find this deal. And it ends up being the house that we buy. It was over budget, but just something about it felt like home. You know, I kind of knew that. And so we buy this house and the mortgage is a thousand dollars and it's, you know, about 150, 200 bucks more than what we were paying. But for me, I just, it felt right. And so we buy it and then it kind of dawns on me. I have this crazy idea. My buddy was thinking about working in advertising. He was living in Austin at the time. And we were looking for interns at our job. And I was like, dude, you should apply for, for the internship. And he was like, wow, well, where am I gonna live? I'm like, you can live with us. And he was like, really? And I was like, yeah, man, it's gonna be great. You could pay us like 400 bucks a month, all bills paid. And I had stumbled onto this incredible concept that no one else had ever done before, where you rent your house out to other people to subsidize the mortgage uh, and, and so it's kind of crazy. That was the first person to ever discover house hacking, uh, at least to me, <laughs> right? I had no idea. Rob, I have to ask, did you, did you offer this to your friend before you ran it by your wife or did you at least ask her first? I did. I did run it by her, but he was a good friend. He was like a mutual, yeah. he was like the, an usher in our wedding. So it was a pretty easy sell. Yeah. Um, but also it was kind of, it is one of those things where it's like, yes, I asked my wife, but I was also like, you don't, we need this financially yeah. to recover from everything else we've ever gone through. And so she was like, okay, all right, let's do it. So did you do a contract or a lease agreement, no. anything formal? No. no, it was just, okay. No, definitely not. Don't yeah. follow my footsteps here, but I did not. Um, but he, you know, we, he was just like, how do I pay you? I was like, how about Venmo? And he was like, yeah, sure. And I remember getting that first Venmo for 400 bucks and being like, I own real estate. I was like, I felt so <laughs> rich. I remember 400 bucks off of a thousand dollars was $600, which is $200 cheaper than my rent. I was winning. I was winning life. And so then I started thinking like, Oh, okay. I've got this thousand square foot basement downstairs. What if I renovated that? And uh, it's a wet basement. A lot of basements in Kansas city are like, they, they're not, they're all wet basements. So you can't really finish them out unless you do a lot of expensive work. And we also didn't have the money to do it. Wait, Rob. So for, for us Californians that, that don't understand basements, what is what is a wet basement and why is that different from like a regular basement? So it basically, from my understanding of it, um, is all the ground, all the soil, like it's just particularly like damp. It snows a lot, for example, in Kansas City. So there's always like snow melt. It all seeps into like the the like the ground and my foundation was like cinder block which is super porous so it basically just means that it's not a dry environment and thus if you put drywall over your walls it starts to get wet and moldy basically oh, gotcha. we see that very okay. common in the buffalo area too especially with older built homes that 
the foundations are like that too, where it's like damp and moist and down there. Yeah. I'm really glad you said that because for the past week, I've been trying to remember who I talked about Buffalo wings with and going to Buffalo. And then that person was like, oh yeah, they're really good here. It was you. I know. And I'm going to overnight you some barbell wings, That's which right. I think are better than any other wings. So yeah. Oh yeah, man, I'm so glad address. we figured this out. <laughs> Woo. Okay. Oh, my address is 555 Main Street. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I don't end up uh, finishing out this basement, but you know, eight. You know, the four hundred dollar a month thing just sort of got me addicted to like making money because I sort of it clicked with me that it wasn't just four hundred dollars off of a thousand bucks, right? It was like four hundred dollars off of what I considered my freedom, right? I felt like if I could get my my mortgage back or like what I was paying, if I could save that every month, that was like freedom because then I had a thousand bucks, you know, to go out and eat with my wife. For example, for reference. You know, you guys, fun fact about me. I love Chipotle. Everybody knows this. But for like the first eight years of my relationship with Chipotle, I straight up only ever bought rice. It was 67 cents. I would go to Chipotle and I would say, hey, can I get rice in a bowl? And they're like, you don't want anything else? I'm like, that's all I can afford for now. But thank you. And so like get house hacking was like the first time that I could be like, you know what? Yes, I will take the entire entree for $8 because I, I can afford it now. And so I was really sprinting to like figure out how I could offset my mortgage. And I remember that next twist for me was like, all right, well, how can I make more money? And so I think a, a lot of real estate investors sort of are like, they, they, they fall into this addiction, right? Where it's like, oh my gosh, like subsidized mortgage. How do I completely knock it out? And I remember wanting to buy this pipe industrial coffee table off of Etsy. And uh, it was $800. And I was like, that's crazy. I would never, this is, must have been like $50 to make this. And so I decide to like build my own. And I was down there for like three weeks. I was building it. And I remember my wife was hanging out with their friends in the living room and I brought it up. And they were all super impressed. All every single one of them. My wife was like, "You built this?" I was like, "Yeah." What what nice timing on your part to bring it up while she's our friends. <laughs> exactly. Here's my masterpiece. All, but they were all like drooling over. They're like, "This is amazing!" And so I was like, "Okay." They they really gave me the confidence to like. I was like, "Well, let me just see what happens when I list this on Craigslist." And someone messaged me the next day, and I sold it for four hundred bucks. And I was like, Whoa. "What? I can make four hundred dollars doing yeah. this?" And so I turned my basement into basically a furniture wood shop for like the better part of a year and a half, maybe two years. I was every night after work, I'd get home at like five or six, I'd eat dinner with my wife and I would go downstairs from like seven to one. And I was just making furniture and I was selling it on Etsy and making like an extra, it wasn't a lot, but it was like 800 bucks a month. And so it wasn't truly a house hack, right? Because I was renting out the the room. But in a sense, like I was trying to figure out how else I could make income with this property in this basement that was completely empty. It was like a thousand square feet, the same size of my house. This was it. And so I was making another 800 bucks here. And by this point, you know, I'm basically breaking even on my mortgage. I got 1200 coming in, bills and expenses and everything like that. And so this sort of like created this addiction for me where I was like, okay, no mortgage means I can keep sort of, uh, I can let it, let it ride a little bit and keep pushing that money and in sort into the next project. So is that how you kind of funded your workshop there? Did you have, did you take the money you were saving from not paying the extra $200 to, or the extra $400 to your mortgage? And were you kind of putting that to build out this workshop or was there not really a lot of expense to starting this furniture business? No, you know, so I kind of did how every woodworker did where we're just sort of doing a lot of really hard manual work. That'd be a lot easier with like an $80 tool kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And so anytime I had a new project, I'd be like, all right, I'm going to buy a planer or I'm going to buy mm -hmm. a joiner. I'm going to buy this or that. Um, and so this all eventually culminates because, you know, I, I we, we love our house. We're finally, I, I don't want to say we're feeling comfortable because, you know, as much as I want to like glorify this part of my story... We were still kind of living like what I considered to be paycheck to paycheck. Like I think after all of our expenses, like right before this, we had like less than a thousand dollars every month to our name after like our mortgage, student loans, which were a thousand bucks a month. Um, and then, uh, what was it? Oh, credit cards. I think we were like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars in credit card debt. So yes, all of this was great. 
and it was paying my mortgage, but this is sort of where the addiction comes in because I'm like, oh, this novel concept of working hard outside of your nine to five and making more money to pay off your, your liabilities, that's what was like really firing off in my mind. And so I was just trying to always find little things here and there to, to figure out, you know what I mean? Like things that I could do to make an extra hundred or 200 bucks. And so that was sort of my brand or my personality in my early corporate life. Did you already have that idea when you started the furniture business that this is something short term, you don't want to have a workshop forever in your basement? Or were you just thinking like day to day, like this is awesome. This is great with no kind of exit strategy of, okay, I need to get more passive investments or more real estate so that I don't have to have this workshop in my basement yet? What was kind of your mindset early on doing that business? Yeah. So it was sort of like a, hey, this is great. I love it. I love making money. And I think I kind of just realized that it was sort of difficult for me to scale that business and have a nine to five job because it was taking me like literally there were nights, (laughs) there were legitimate nights where I would get done making my furniture And then I would come upstairs and my wife was getting ready for work because she woke up at like five or six and she's like, you're barely going to bed. I'm like, yeah, I couldn't figure out how to like make this table or whatever. And so, no, I didn't necessarily have this long term business for it. I think what happened sort of towards the end as I was getting burnout, as anyone would, my wife and I just sort of felt like Kansas City was really great for us. We had no idea it was going to be this amazing city, but we were like, let's do something else. Like let's, let's go on to whatever the next thing is. And we were still really broke. We were making it work. Right. Um, house poor is like really the best way to put it. But I do remember like, we were like, well, what should we do? And we're like, all right, let's map it out. We're really broke. We don't have a lot of money. How about we move to LA? <laughs> and, we, and we were like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And uh, that's exactly what we did. We moved to LA after you know three or four years of living in Kansas City. And did you buy a property there or did you rent it? Well, initially we rented. We I went back into the same trap of like, okay, I bought this. Or I rented this 660 square foot apartment. It was a one bedroom, one bath. It was my wife and I. And it was way smaller than the house that we had sold, right? Because in my house, I had an 1100 square foot house, a thousand square foot basement, and I'm paying eighteen hundred dollars, eighteen forty nine, because they were charging me pet rent in this apartment for like six months, and it just really made me st- sick to my stomach. You know, something didn't feel right. That I felt like I had sort of regressed. And granted, like we weren't struggling quite as much at this point because we had gotten really big, significant raise- raises at, at our job, um, each of us, and so we were actually doing okay for the first time. But it just felt weird paying $1,800 to someone never getting it back. And so about six months in, I'm just like, you know what? Let's buy a house. And my wife was like, we can't afford that. And I was like, we definitely can't. But here's what happened. We sold our house in Kansas City for $215,000. And that was crazy for us because we listed it for one ninety five. dollars Remember, we bought it for one fifty nine. dollars We listed it for one ninety five. dollars We got three offers the first day, and one of them was $215,000. And uh, sadly, it didn't appraise. So I think, I don't know, I ended up, we ended up meeting in the middle at 208. But after all of our furnish, sorry, all, after all of our closing fees, our commissions, all that stuff, we had a profit of $40,000 from that house, and we owned it for two years. And so... I think that was sort of like, not only was that groundbreaking, because it was the most money I'd ever had in my life in my bank account, my wife and I, but it was like, oh, wow, this all happened because I invested $5,000 or 6000 whatever 3.5% is of 159000 We bought a house with that. And granted, the we just happened to be in Kansas City at a time where it was exploding, but it we made $40,000 from this house in two years. That was my salary. That was a life-changing amount of money. And I, but while we were moving to LA, my wife was like, well, hey, babe, you, you've got $40,000 in student loan debt. Do you want to just pay it off? And I was like, no, nah, I don't think so. And she was like, why? You're always complaining about we can't afford the $1,000 payment and this and that. And if you like do this. And I was like, I know, I know. But 
I just feel like there's something we can do with this $40,000 that isn't paying off my student loans. And I know it's crazy, but I think we got to sit on this, on this money. I think we have to, I think we just have to figure something else out with it. And she's like, all right, you know, if you feel that way, I was like, I do, I, I really do. And so we rent this apartment and we're living there for six months. And the $40,000 is just, you know, decaying in our bank account, like, right. Paying, paying this mortgage. And so that's sort of where I had this idea. I was like, let's buy this house. Wife is like, I don't know if we can afford it. I was like, I don't either, but we do have enough for a three and a half percent down payment with an FHA loan. And I was like, I think we should try it. And so same type of thing. Like we start the house hunt and uh, everything in LA, by the way, is a very expensive market for anyone that doesn't know. And our budget was like 450,000, which was like very laughable even for that time. So we struck out, struck out, struck out, really just heartbroken. And I think early on, I kind of just realized what you should, the, the first lesson you should ever learn in real estate is to never get married to your house. Never get excited, never get your hopes up until you are at the closing table and you close on that house because so many things can happen before then. And so we kept falling in love with these houses and we kept losing them. And we tried writing the letter, we did everything, and we just lost over and over and over again. And I think we gave up. We did. Um, and we're living in our apartment, whatever, we have six months left on our lease. And then guess what? Like, same exact thing, like a, 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 like a week later, our realtor calls us and is like, hey, I've got this off-market property. And I was like, okay, tell me more. And she's like, and it's got a basement underneath, and you can rent the basement. And I was like, oh my gosh, we did it. Like that, that's totally what we need. And because when I was looking in LA, I was looking for something that I could house hack with, right? Like I had learned this principle early on and I was like, all right, if I'm going to pay a $4,000 mortgage, I have to make money some other way or else I'm going to be paying a ton of money in, in, in mortgage every month. And so the realtor calls, she's like, I've got this house with the, it's a, not even a ba- It's like a, a bonus space, 279 square feet. And I remember walking in and being like, all right, needs a lot of work, but it was uh, exactly what we needed. And it was $624,000, which was embarrassing at the time because when we closed on this house, like I couldn't look, I, my, I was scared to tell my family. I was scared to tell my friends. I was scared to tell my coworkers how much this house cost because I knew that they would think either, wow, he must make a lot of money if he can afford that or he's an idiot for spending that much money on a house. And really, that was probably the case. Like It was so foolish for me to do that. But I just knew that, again, if I could just figure out how someone else could pay my mortgage, then it was it, it worked for me once, right? I bought this house in Kansas City. I made $400,000 or $40,000 on it. And I was like, if I just keep doing that, eventually I'll have a lot of money, I think. And so we buy this house and I had calculated that if I rented that little 279 square foot studio on on Airbnb, on this crazy platform where people pay you every night to sleep in your place, I remember thinking like, if I could do that, I think I could make like 50 to 75% of my mortgage. And so that was sort of like my my laying the heart on the table to my wife. I was like, I think we can do this. Like, believe in me, like you always have. And if you do, we're going to make it work. And that's what we did. We bought the house. A couple of things I just want to I want to point out that you mentioned. Um, first, you, you talked a little bit about like, hey, you had this this lump of cash that you could have used to pay off your your student loan debt. Um, just off, off the top of your head, like ballpark, what, like what was the interest rate on your student loan debt? Um, so a lot of them were government subsidized. So I had yeah. uh, interest that was anywhere from two and a half to like three yeah. and a half percent. Super mostly. super low interest debt, right? Yeah. And um, I, dude, I was actually just reading an article this morning about Jay Z and Beyonce. You know, they're billionaires, and they bought this like eighty-eight million dollar mansion, uh, like in Bel Air somewhere. And uh, you know, a billionaire, you could probably Jay Z and Beyonce could probably you know have the cash to to just buy that outright. But mm-hmm. they even got a mortgage when they bought that property. I mean, they, they put down thirty-five million, but they still had a a, a mortgage for what is that like fifty-three million dollars. And, you know, if you see Jay-Z and Beyonce leveraging debt in a smart way, it's because they know, even at a 6% interest rate, if they got $53 million in cash with their name, with their businesses, they could go out and, and 10x that money if they wanted yeah. to. So for the rookies that are listening, I think there's something to consider as well where, you know, you, you want to do the math 
and understand like, okay, if I've got student loan debt at 2%, but I can go and invest this into real estate and get 10% or 12% or 15% or 20%, like which one makes more sense for me financially long-term? It does take a little bit of courage, which I think Rob is something mm-hmm. you, you've shown that you have, but for a lot of people, it is the the right choice um, financially. And that kind of takes into my next point that you you've done a really good job throughout this story, Rob, of taking somewhat calculated risks, right? The the first investment, it was, hey, we're paying eight hundred dollars in, in in rent. Can we stretch to get to a thousand dollars in our mortgage? Okay, then how can we subsidize that? Then you get this proof of concept in a, a, a less expensive market in Kansas City, and you say, okay, how can we now replicate this in a more expensive market like Los Angeles? So you didn't like jump off the the deep end, right, and go from, yeah. hey, I'm, I'm renting an eight hundred dollar apartment in Kansas City to I'm buying a six hundred thousand dollar house in L A. There were steps in between. So I think for our rookies, as, as you're listening to Rob's story, the things that are important for you to take away are what are the what are the baby steps you can start taking in the same way that Rob did to start proving out that concept to to make sure that you're not overextending yourself. And then the the last thing, Rob, the, and this is kind of where I want your your input. You've said the same phrase a couple of times now, but you said that you you pitched your wife. I think I've heard you say it mm-hmm. two or three times now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for a lot of our rookies, that's a challenge that they have is how do I get my spouse on board with these crazy ideas that I have? So for, from you, Rob, and your experience, like, like, why do you think you were able to get your wife to be supportive of these, you know, kind of big steps that you wanted to take as it yeah. came to uh, real estate investing? First of all, I was in advertising. Uh, so everything I did was a pitch <laughs> in, in life, at work and everything like that. Um, but really, I think you're, you're so right in that these are all calculated risks. And everything is like, based on experience. It's never like I just went and did something other than buying the first house with no experience. Everything was always sort of leveling up accordingly, right? There was one control variable in every single risk or every single experiment that I ever took. And that control variable was me. I knew what I could do. I knew that when I want something, I will make it happen. And I believed in myself every step of the way. And I think if I had, you know, probably approach that conversation with my wife, like, Hey, I don't know if it, I don't know if I'm, I don't think I'm good at this, but I'm going to do it. She probably would have been like, well, let's, you know, let's take a breather champ. But I think like her just seeing how serious I was, it wasn't like I was ever like, Hey, yeah, like, let's just, I don't know. Let's just do this. Like, it was always like, Hey, let's do this because I genuinely believe it's going to change our life. And so it's hard for her to, you know, I think it was just hard for her to like see any other alternative because she was so sold in as well. Like, okay, hey, like you've done, you've done right by me along the way and you're going to continue to do that. And so let's do this thing. And she was all, always like the person that, you know, was, I, I always say this, like I'm an astronaut outside of the space station floating around in space and Ash was my tether. She keeps me attached to the ship so I don't float away in space. So I always had little things or whatever. And when I wasn't super confident in those things, she'd be like, eh, I don't think, I, I think you don't even believe this. I'm like, yeah, you're right. But for the stuff that I'm for real on, she was always on board 100%. Robin, I think that's such an important distinction because you know, again, we get asked this question often from rookies that are you know fans of the podcast that are doing everything. And they're like, hey, how can I get my spouse on board? And a lot of it comes down to you asking yourself, have I really earned my partner's trust and respect to get totally. on board with this idea of real estate investing. And, you know, you're, you, Ash and I had a conversation, your wife and I had a conversation. Um, I think it was at, at your event or one of the times that I saw her in person. And uh, we were talking about starting this little fitness competition with each other. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I was kind of laughing. It's like, ah, oh, you know, whatever, I'm going to beat Rob this, that, and the other. And she says something to me that stuck out to me. She was like, and she, she kind of looked at me. She's like, hmm, I don't know, Tony. Like when Rob really puts his mind to something, I don't think anyone can really beat him. And that's something that you've shown and proven throughout your entire relationship to your wife for her to have that kind of trust and faith and confidence in you. So for all of our rookies that are listening, if your spouse isn't on board, I think one of the things you need to do is look in the mirror and say, okay, why haven't I earned that that support from my spouse? Yeah. Wow. That's really nice of her. That, that's the nicest thing she's ever said. No, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna take her out tonight. That is that honestly is so so touching that, that, is that really she sweet. says so nice things about me behind my back. Isn't that how it should be, by the way? (laughs) 
Oh, man. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. No, of course, man. Um, well, let, let's keep the story going, brother. So you, you got the house hack in KC, you get the house hack in, in LA, but you, I mean, you're, you're buying this house, but you also have the apartment. So are you just like, like breaking your lease or like, what are you doing with the apartment when you, when you move into the house? Right, right, right. Okay. So that was sort of the, that big conversation that I had with her. I was like, let's buy this house. And she's like, what about the apartment? It's like 1800 bucks. Like we have six months left on the lease. And I was like, all right. Yes, I hear that. And he, allow me to rebuttal. There is this website. It is called Airbnb. And if you put your apartment on it, people will pay you like 100 bucks a night. And so this is all the Wild West, right? We had no idea what Airbnb was, if it was going to work. And she was like, well, do you think it'll work? And I was like, I mean, we, we rented our house long term for 400 bucks in Kansas City. And LA is easily like you know, four times more expensive. So in theory, I should be able to make a lot more. And so we buy this house with the intention of Airbnb being the the little studio apartment that I told you about. And so I was faced with this with this decision. I was like, all right, well I have to either break my lease and pay like eight thousand bucks, or I could sublease it and just break even. But I was so interested in this concept of like, okay, what if I listed on Airbnb and I could make a delta the the in between right if, if i have this rent at 1800 bucks if i'm charging 100 dollars a night that's 18 you know 18 nights later i'm breaking even so if i can book it for 20 nights or 24 nights i'll make all that that juice afterwards and so honestly it was risky i didn't know anything about airbnb but i was like well the alternative is like i i let the lease run out and i just pay 1800 bucks every month so I ended up listing that apartment on Airbnb. Um, again, this was like seven years ago. Like, so was there like no rule in your lease agreement that you couldn't do that then? There probably was. I have no idea. Like I do remember going to the leasing agent and, and being like, hey, yeah, so Airbnb, like do people do that here? Do y'all care? And like she was like, eh, yeah, they sometimes they do. Not really. Yeah. And I was like, great, good enough for me. And I like ran <laughs> off. And I remember thinking like, now, now in retrospect, it's very funny to me because that property, like that leasing agent, definitely making like, I don't know, 10, 12 bucks an hour, right? Like doesn't actually care about the management of the place. She's just clocking in and like, you know, creating leases and stuff. And also she probably didn't really even know. This was like 2017. Right. So, you know, and I didn't either. I didn't realize, oh, that is a liability for like apartments or anything like that. So... I, in my my mind, I kind of felt like, yeah, hey, so you don't care? And they're like, yeah, not really. And I was like, all right, sounds good. And uh, that was like the first one I ever did. But, you know, after that lease ran out, we kind of like moved on to actually, I think I figured out pretty quickly that if I want to scale and do this, like I got to I gotta own the real estate. And so that ended up being very true throughout the rest of my career. Um, but I was able to basically like make money from that first apartment. And it did kind of, again, trigger this like spark in my mind of like, oh my gosh, like I could use other people's property and list that and make money off of that. And then on top of that, I've got this house in LA that I bought. My mortgage was $4,400. And the catch was that it was a complete fixer upper. And I had to renovate that studio. And for a lot of people at home, you may not know this, but when you buy a a mortgage or when you buy a house, you don't really get your first mortgage for like a month to two months. It, it takes a while for it to process and for that first one to hit. Like your first payment due. Your first same, payment. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so like I had closed, we had calculated it with the mortgage broker at the exact day that would basically give us like 50 to 60 days to do it. Right. And so I knew I buy this house and it is a ticking time bomb before that first $4,400 mortgage is going to hit. And I was like, I need to completely remodel this 279 square foot studio before I can list it on Airbnb. And I don't have a lot of time to do it. And so <laughs> I go in and I'm like, I don't really know much. I had started doing some DIY type of stuff in Kansas City. I had built furniture. And so I felt like I could do it. Like I was like, I think I can graduate onto like remodeling a little square, like a little studio. And so every night after work, and I, my job was like an hour away from my house. It was only like three miles away because it's freaking LA. But I'd get home at like 7, 7.30, go give my wife a kiss, maybe a little hug, and then run over to Home Depot, buy whatever 
drywall or whatever I needed. I would get a Red Bull and I would get sour cream and cheddar ruffles and I would go down into that studio until four or five in the morning every single night for two months and I demoed it. I took all the ground out and I had gotten it all pretty much gutted to where it needed to be. And I remember thinking, all right, now I just have to tile this bad boy. And I'm like, good to go. And so (laughs) I like buy this tile, like that's three hours away, but it was a good deal. And I drive to like Lancaster, California or something. I don't remember. It was like two hours away. And I get all this tile. I load it up in the back of my car. I drive home and I'm like, all right, time to tile this less than 300 square foot studio. And I started tiling it. (laughs) And my wife is like, again, it's like morning, right? And like she comes down and she's like, this is all you've tiled? And I was like, what do you mean? This, this, is, this is art, babe. And I had only tiled like four by four. Like I had no idea how to like do anything. And I had only tiled like 16 square feet. And my back hurt. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like I actually, I did fail at this. Dang, I thought I could do anything, but I did fail at this. How did you even like know what to do though? Where to start? Did you YouTube it? Or how did, did. you even know what I materials did. to buy? Yeah, I YouTubed it. And all the YouTube videos, those freaking YouTubers, they always make it seem a lot easier. And then the guy's like, oh, all you have to do is back butter. And then you back butter here and you place (laughs) it down. And I was like, oh, I could do that. This old house, thanks. And so like I tried it, but no, it's not. Tiling is, I have the utmost respect for both tilers and their backs because that was a very (laughs) difficult thing. So I knew early on, okay, hey, call, call, call it in when you can, when you like, like, Fold when you know you can't play the hand, right? And I was like, I am not going to learn how to tile. That is not my gift. That is not my my talent. And so I ended up hiring that out. The guy comes to my house, literally laughs at the the job. He goes, this is it? And I was like, yeah. He's like, this took you eight hours? <laughs> and I was like, yes. And he was like, literally just very insulting. But he was also like 500 bucks. And I remember being like, 500? Are you kidding me? Boom, let's do it. I don't have it, but I'm, it's so worth it for me. <laughs> that was nice of him to still give you like honest pricing because for a lot yeah. of tilers, if they came in and saw that you did that little square for eight hours, that would be like, hey, maybe 3,000 bucks to tile the rest of this. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah that's, a, that's a great deal, actually. <laughs> and at that moment, I probably would have done it. So <laughs> yeah. and he, he does it and he does it in less than in eight hours. Um, it was crazy how fast he did it. And this is a fun little story about this whole thing. A little fun fact that I actually just realized um, pre, like when we were planning this out, the very first YouTube video that I had ever wanted to make was of this studio. And I actually set a camera up and documented the whole process from start to finish. And I remember looking at that, that footage and, and saying, this is absolute garbage. And I closed my computer and I put the, I put that footage out. I think I deleted it. And I was so hung up on having a perfect product that I never went on to actually edit it or post it to YouTube. And the reason I tell that story is because I, I am a YouTuber now, the Rob Built channel. And the very first video I made for that really wasn't that much better than that first one I had ever made. But the difference is there was like, a seven year delay in between both of those between my first YouTube video now and the one that I never published. And so I always like to tell people like, if you're interested in documenting your journey, there are so many benefits to doing that. There are so many benefits. You get people to know you and understand you and trust you people in your, your sphere who might want to invest with you. And I lost out on seven years of those relationships because I was so scared to put myself out there with an imperfect product. And had I done it earlier, who knows? Maybe the Raw Built channel would have existed seven years earlier and my life would be even more different than it is now. Uh, I don't regret it. I'm happy with where things are, but it's just kind of funny to me that me, of all people, was so scared of posting my first YouTube video. And so just a little encouragement for those of you that have created that Instagram account or whatever, document the journey. Don't be afraid to fail. I sure, I, I, I wasn't afraid to fail on the DIY side. I was afraid to, to fail on the content side. But do it. Put yourself out there because it opens some pretty crazy doors. And there's somebody that's going to take value from it. Someone that is going to appreciate um, what you're sharing along your journey too. 
Yeah. 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 Rob, so just to kind of finish things off, so you you get this this little studio tiled. I'm assuming you then launch that property onto Airbnb mm-hmm. as well. So you get the the apartment unit that's that you're arbitraging basically. You get your basement unit that you're renting out on, on Airbnb as well. Um I, I guess the question is, are you are you able to cover your mortgage, this new forty four hundred dollar mortgage with the income coming in from those two units. Oh yeah, baby. Are you kidding me? It was great. <laughs> I man, I was living the life at that moment because not so, you know, in Kansas City I was saving the thousand dollars. My reference point in LA was my eighteen hundred dollar mortgage or eighteen hundred dollar rent in that apartment. So then buying the house as a forty four hundred dollar mortgage. Yeah. So studio ends up totally panning out. Literally like I am hanging up curtains and like screwing a, a, a screw in the final screw into the wall, Airbnb guest knocks on the door and checks in and they're like, oh, hey, I'm like, ah, I'm so sorry. This is my first time doing this. Like, I'm just getting get ready, blah, blah, blah. And so that ends up, yeah, basically end up making two to three thousand dollars a month on that studio. And then wow. the apartment that I was arbitraging was making like one to two thousand dollars profit. And so basically wow. on a perfect month, I was making more money than my mortgage and that was sort of like, oh, like I, I figured it out again. Yeah. And it's addicting because when you can finish that, figure out that puzzle, you just want to keep going to the next hardest puzzle. And Rob, I love that you that you ended on that, man, because that's exactly what you've been doing. I mentioned this earlier, but it's like you you test an idea, then you expand it. You test an idea, then you expand it because you had the, the KC property, you house hacked, then you went to LA, you house hacked again, but this time with Airbnb, then you did the rental arbitrage. And then we didn't really get into this, but uh, mm-hmm. you also built then the tiny home in your backyard in LA, but it was like a, a pared down version, right? And then you rebuilt that same tiny home and Joshua Tree, but a much bigger, mm-hmm. nicer version. So that's just been like what you've done consistently throughout your your career, Rob, is you test something smaller, then you do a little bit bigger, then you go a little bit bigger, then you go a little bit bigger. And I think that, if anything, is the the big takeaway from uh from our rookies that are listening today, man. But dude, thank you for for sharing your story, man. I I, I really, you know, we never really get to dive in like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me just say one final thing to kind of cap off that LA property. You know, I, I said that that Kansas City house, I bought it for one fifty nine. I sold it for two fifteen, and that was a forty thousand dollar profit that I had sent in my bank account. I was ten times more petrified to buy that L.A. property when I bought it for six twenty four. That house today is worth between one point two and one point three million dollars, and I want to end on this because it's crazy to think that I put. Uh, $18,500 as a down payment. I had a bunch of seller credits and stuff, but I put down 18,500 bucks. And if I lost everything tomorrow, I could sell that house and have like half a million dollars in my bank account because I believed in myself, because I knew that real estate could unlock the opportunities for me that my parents always wanted me to have. And it's really cool that that house was really sort of the beginning of of what would eventually become my my real estate empire. It really was. I mean, obviously there's the Kansas City house was first, but the lessons I learned in that LA house were the ones that shaped me into who I am today, and it all came down to me believing in myself, my wife believing in me, and uh everyone else that believed in me along the way. So super happy and grateful to be here. And thanks for letting me tell my story. Yeah, that's amazing, Rob. What a way to end the show. I mean, that was that was great. I, I can tell you've done this uh, talking in front of the microphone one or one or two times before. <laughs> I've done a, pod, a time or two, but you know, I've never really told this story. Really, right, not like yeah. this. Yeah. And uh, it's really cool to come and talk about it. And it's really nice to go and focus on the details of like the the days when I was a nobody with nothing. It is, it's the most special time in my life when people are struggling, when people are like, I, I'm spread thin. I, this is so hard. I'm like, I am so jealous of what you're going through because you only get to go through that one time. And I, I miss those years so much. Mm-hmm. So enjoy it. Enjoy the process, peeps. Yep. Enjoy the journey. Rob, I want to take us to our rookie exam before we let you get out of here, man. So these are the, the three most important questions you'll ever be asked in your entire life, man. So are you ready for the first question? Sure. Let's do it. All right. Question number one, what is one actionable thing Ricky should do after listening to your episode? Go get pre-approved for whatever house that you're thinking about doing, because that is the first thing that will tell you what you can and can't buy. Uh, everybody's like, oh, where am I going to buy a house? What market? What this? Uh, blah, blah, blah. 
Find out how much you can afford first, get approved with a mortgage person. That will set the ultimate guardrails on how you can make your next step. Rob, what is one tool, app, or system you use in your business today? The greatest tool I have is my camera. Mm -hmm. The best camera on the market is the one that you have in your pocket. And the hardest part about making content is hit and record. So never be scared to just turn on your camera and document whatever house flip, house hack, new construction that you're in. I love that answer, Rob. And, uh, you know, Ash and I talk about this all the time about the, the power of documenting your journey. And, you know, I think, you know, all of our lives have really been impacted by content, right? And, and us kind of sharing what's going on in our lives. Like, I would not be in front of this microphone right now talking to any of you had I not started my own podcast before. Like, that's how I came into the Bigger Pockets ecosystem. Rob started his YouTube channel. Ashley was on social media and had a decent following there. Like, all of us had some way that, content played a role in our ability to, to grow our businesses. So for all of our Rickies that are following, don't think that you have to wait until you're this massively successful person. Just grab that camera and, and document the journey that you're going on. All right, Rob, last question for the exam. Where does Robert Abasolo plan on being five years from now? Oh, that's how I know you really know me because you called me Robert. <laughs> um, five years from now. Uh, I think I'd like to be at 500 units. Um, I'm currently working on a bunch of developments, glamp sites, uh, unique tiny home stays, and I want to get to 100 by the end of this year. And I guess if we just carry that math on, 500 of the coolest units on the face of the planet, that's where, that's where I want to be. Okay. Well, Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and please tell everyone um, where they can reach out to you. And you also have a, a big event coming up too that I've seen and heard yes. all over about. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. Okay. Yeah. So you can find me over on uh, YouTube or Instagram or threads if you're really in on the know at Rob Bilt, R-O-B-U-I-L-T. And, uh, or you could find me at my conference, HostCon. It's happening in Houston, Texas in October 28th through the 30th. Uh, it'll be a perfect final leg to the Bigger Pockets conference. It's right after that. Come to both. Come hang out with me. You can find out more over at HostCon.com. And obviously, the best place to find me is three times a week over at the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast Show, where you can learn about real estate, entrepreneurship, scaling, and everything in between. Yes, we love that show. And Rob, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. It's definitely an honor to have you on the Rookie Podcast and to share your childhood journey and your very beginnings as house hacking. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ashley at Wealthform Rentals, and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson on Instagram. And we will be back on Saturday with a Rookie Reply. Still